before uh, getting Jan Crawford Greenberg's uh, insights, I just wanted to mention that uh, the Chief Justice, <laughs> when he's not at a ball game, uh, <laughs> and, uh, has made some remarks about the types of people he'd like to see appointed to his court, uh, just in case when the president dropped by, he had a few suggestions for him. <laughs> and, he, what, and the thing that Chief Justice Roberts has said most recently is that he likes prior judicial experience. He thinks that's the sine qua non of, uh, of, uh, uh, of appointment. So Since all of he you. Had so much. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, he got on there eventually. <laughs> but the, and, and his reasoning was that uh, because judges have a method of analysis and argument that has been transformed from the kind of policy perspectives that they may have had prior to assuming the bench that they now have structured in terms of legal argumentation. Now, I'm, that may or may not be consistent with part of what, what, what you were saying. Uh, and uh, he also was of the view that precedents are uh, much more important to judges in terms of experience than to others. Now, the political science literature on this tends to suggest that, uh, or question uh, Chief Justice Roberts, but the one who questions him the most is probably Justice Frankfurter, who wrote in 1957 that the correlation between prior judicial experience and fitness for the function of the Supreme Court is, he said, zero. I don't know. He said it. I didn't say it. Write him. Uh, write his family. Jan Crawford Greenberg is a great friend of this or law blog school. Blog about it. Well, you, can blog, you can blog on Jan's blog, which is perhaps the only. But you aren't talking about my blog. You were saying you don't read. Well, your your blog is is, is practically a law review in in, in its uh, in its uh, development. I write too long, is what he's saying. Should be more concise. I'm going to give up on this introduction. <laughs> Jan Crawford Greenberg covers the Supreme Court of the United States and does legal analysis generally for ABC News. Prior to that, she was a longtime national legal affairs reporter for the Chicago Tribune and an analyst for the Jim Lehrer News Hour. Uh, her work is elegant in every way and in every respect, both in terms of the intelligence it manifests, the practicality that it brings to bear in terms of common sense, and in terms of just simply the, the grace with which she writes, and it's always nice to have her, Jan Crawford Greenberg. Well, thank, you. thank you, Doug, uh, for those very generous, much too generous uh, comments. And Dean Starr, thank you again for having me here. It's just always wonderful uh, to be at Pepperdine. I'm sure all of you agree uh, with that. This is a pretty good place for a judicial clerkship institute. Um, I am going to take uh, uh, some of uh, Chris's uh, really insightful comments and, and obviously coming off his book, which, uh, really good timing, by the way, <laughs> um, on the book, and, and apply it, looking back over the last uh, uh, 20 or so years, uh, at the court that uh, William Rehnquist led, uh, the Rehnquist Court. Um, obviously, as we all know, I mean, a Supreme Court nomination can be a president's most lasting legacy. And I mean, you already see now, I mean, President Obama is already uh, starting to undo many of the programs and policies that George Bush put into place. But one area that he will not be able to touch uh, at all is the Supreme Court until a justice decides it's time to go. Um, and then uh, the justice, uh, I mean, the stars kind of have to be in alignment for the president to have lasting change. Uh, the justice uh, of a different ideology uh, needs to retire. The Senate, preferably, will be in the same, uh, of the same political party as, as the White House. All of these things kind of have to line up. And even when they do, uh, justices uh, get on that court and they're beholden to no one. Uh, so they can surprise. So when you look back over the last 20 years, uh, kind of the story of the Rehnquist Court, the nominations, um, the confirmations, it's in many ways uh, a story of missteps, mistakes, uh, missed opportunities, and, and some golden opportunities for people who didn't even know that they were getting ready to be struck by lightning 
uh, in the form of a Supreme Court nomination. I started covering the Supreme Court in 1994. That was the year that uh, Justice Breyer joined the Supreme Court, and over the next 11 years, that Supreme Court would remain intact. That's the longest period in history that we've gone without a change in membership. Normally, we'll have a vacancy, what, every two and a half, three years or so? So obviously, to go 11 years, uh, the court falls into, or begins to fall into some pretty predictable patterns, and the Rehnquist Court was no exception. You know, you had your four pretty solid liberal justices, your four pretty, more or less, uh, solid judicial conservatives, and then you had that justice in the middle, uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, um, the swing vote. Although, I know she's coming out here, you said, next week? Yes. Justice O'Connor? I'm sure you know this, but she hates to be called the swing vote, so don't call her that. <laughs> Thank you. But on all of those cases, uh, all the social cases that we cover in the news, uh, that, that are on the front pages of newspapers, on the, on the network news broadcasts, the social issues, affirmative action, abortion, religion, on all of those cases, more often than not, Justice O'Connor was casting the deciding vote, and more often than not, she was casting that deciding vote with the liberals. Now, around, I guess, uh, uh, 2000, uh, you know, everyone in the press, we all know everything. So we started <laughs> writing all these stories, and Chris, you really have to be careful when you start predicting five <laughs> Supreme Court uh, nominations for President Obama. But we all wrote stories in 2000, leading up to the election, that the next president, whether it was Bush or Gore, the next president was going to get one at least, for sure, maybe two, maybe even three nominations. I mean, you can go back and check it. We all wrote these things. Um, because look, it had already been six years, and obviously that's the longest uh, that we've had uh, in a long time. Typically, we get a retirement or a vacancy every two and a half, three years, so we were confident that the next president, Bush or, or Gore, would get one or two, maybe even three. Well, then of course, you know, uh, there was Bush versus Gore, and uh, those justices stayed together again uh, for the duration of President Bush's first term. As you recall, I'm sure, the weekend before the presidential election in 2004, uh, the Chief Justice William Rehnquist announced that he had thyroid cancer. So then uh, it was clear to everyone uh, that the next president, and of course uh, President Bush won re-election that Tuesday, was going to get not only a nomination, but a, a pretty big one. Uh, the chance to fill the center seat, uh, to replace the Chief Justice, uh, a chance to put his own stamp on that Supreme Court uh, for the first time uh, in replacing a Chief Justice in, in um, w nearly 20 years. Um, so, you know, we all again uh, began uh, getting ready for the, the expected Rehnquist retirement. Uh, the White House started uh, flying uh, candidates in, interviewing people, vetting people thoroughly, uh, expecting fully that William Rehnquist would be retiring at the end of that term if he lived that long. You know, he missed four months of argument, and when he came back, uh, he was uh, a very, very sick man, almost dying before I eyes. He lost an enormous amount of weight. His face was gray in tone. He was very stooped over. He had a tracheotomy, so that booming baritone those of you who know people who clerk for Rehnquist or head professors, it's funny, they kind of instinctively talk, you know, they'll start talking like uh, <laughs> William Rehnquist. But, you know, that was all gone. And I, I remember one time when he took the bench, uh, he'd lost so much weight that his uh, wristwatch, you know, was just kind of uh, uh, dangling around his, his knuckles. He was so thin. So we were sure that, that Rehnquist was going to be stepping down, giving President Bush the chance uh, to nominate uh, the next Chief Justice. And around this time, um, Penguin approached me about writing a book on the court at this moment of historic change. And I was obviously really eager to do this because one of the things that I found so striking about covering the court is how that court, the Rehnquist Court, became a court that in so many ways was such a disappointment to conservatives. Seven of those nine justices had been nominated by Republican presidents, yet on case after case, um, in part because of Justice O'Connor, but still there were seven uh, justices nominated by Republican presidents. On all those social issues, it was a court that more often than not 
took a more liberal path, certainly than conservatives had hoped and expected. And so as part of my research when I was, we were all certain um, that William Rehnquist would be retiring, uh, I started looking at why was that? What happened to that court? Why did the Rehnquist court become such a disappointing court to conservatives? And there obviously um, were many reasons, um, uh, many failures uh, in the nominations process. Uh, some of the justices uh, turned out to be, if you're a conservative, uh, uh, just a, a gross uh, mistake, a gross miscalculation. And I'm sure all of you now that light bulb's going on and you're thinking David Souter. Um, when President uh, Bush, uh, George H.W. Bush, nominated uh, David Souter, he was looking at one of those rare historical moments when he had a chance to move that court, to make a difference on that court, because he was going to be replacing a liberal legend, William Brennan. So this was a moment the conservatives were euphoric. Finally, they would get a chance to replace this liberal icon uh, and, and, and put on a justice who had a more conservative ideology. I, I talk about this in, in some detail uh, in the book and how David Souter came to be the nominee. Um, but part of the backstory uh, and, and part of how this miscalculation uh, from the president's perspective came about involves obviously uh, the dean of this uh, fine institution, uh, Dean Starr, uh, who was long expected to be that nominee uh, to take that position. But again, as, as you will see in a nominations process, and there's so much that we will never know until someone writes a book 20 years from now, going on behind the scenes now in the Obama administration about you know, who's pushing who and who believes someone will not be solid. There were a core group of, of lawyers in the Justice Department at the time who believed that Dean Starr, and I'm sorry if this is uncomfortable, um, but that believed Dean Starr was not reliably and predictably conservative enough. Um, that he would not necessarily be That was not a laugh line. <laughs> It is hard to believe. In fact, that's kind of the laugh that I get when I tell this story, particularly in very, like, you know, somewhere like, particularly if you speak, say, you know, Malibu or, or even up in San Francisco, and like, no one can believe it. Um, but they believed that he was not going to be a, a solid conservative, and that's what they wanted on that court. They had suffered these disappointments, they had gone through the Kennedy uh, nomination, and they were ready for someone that they knew that they could count on. And they were effective in blocking. Uh, Dean Starr from getting onto the very, very tippy top shortlist. But what they didn't count on uh, was that that then kind of created this vacuum uh, for people in the White House, uh, namely John Sununu, working with uh, Warren Redmond, to propose a very decent, uh, very well respected, very little known, and completely inexperienced federal appeals court judge named David Souter. Um, President Bush's advisors assured him that David Souter would be a solid judicial conservative. They had no idea what they were talking about. <laughs> David Souter had not even <clears throat> written a, a federal appeals court opinion. Um, he didn't really have a judicial philosophy. And I did spend, I'll admit, a fair amount of time uh, in doing my research trying to figure out if he had just done, like, really pulled a fast one, like if he was, you know, really had been a liberal in disguise or a more moderate. And he just had not really worked through these issues um, even on, on his own. But it was very clear to the White House, uh, during even his uh, nomination, his confirmation hearings, the lawyers I talked to were in the White House Counsel's Office at the time said they were watching these hearings on television uh, back in the, uh, in the White House, in the Counsel's Office, and they were listening as they heard David Souter um, heap praise, uh, exaggerated praise, on William Brennan. And then he started talking about how courts uh, must act if the legislatures are unwilling, that courts must step into the vacuum, which really is not what you want to hear if you're a <laughs> conservative. Um, and so they all said they just had this sinking feeling. <laughs> and um, at one point, Boyd and Gray, who was the White House counsel, uh, like bursts through the doors and says, my God, what have we done? Um, and it would become pretty clear uh, 
really as, as soon as his second year on the Supreme Court that what they had done was not nominate uh, a judicial conservative. Um, George Bush uh, got one more chance, H.W., uh, the father, and it came the very next year. Now think about this. Again, when we're talking about the nominations process and we're thinking now about what President Obama can do and what he may be able to do to that Supreme Court, um, a lot of things have to obviously really line up. And they lined up for George H.W. Bush. He got, as we said, that historic opportunity to replace William Brennan. The very next year, he got another historic opportunity to replace another liberal icon when Thurgood Marshall announced that he was stepping down. Conservatives were thrilled. I mean, this was now the time when you know we, they could turn that court away from the excesses of the Warren Court era, finally restore, as they saw it, judicial restraint to that institution. Liberals were terrified. After all, it had just been a year uh, that, that President Bush had appointed David Souter, and, and the liberal groups were starting to think maybe he wouldn't be so bad. When the Souter nomination was announced, now and the other, uh, some of the other groups, put flyers up, they're, they're, they're out in the, uh, the library, in the files, the, the Bush library, uh, stop Souter or women will die. I mean, this is how polarized, and, and people believe that this was really, these were the stakes. So okay, so George H.W. Bush puts Souter on for Brennan. The very next year, he nominates Clarence Thomas to replace this liberal giant Thurgood Marshall. Now, the story of Justice Thomas, I believe, is one of the most grossly misunderstood and misreported stories in modern Supreme Court history. When Clarence Thomas joined that Supreme Court um, back in 1991, he had gone through, and again, I mean, uh, many books have been written about this, uh, and this is another case study in um, how not to do a Supreme Court confirmation hearing. Um, but he had gone through a brutal confirmation hearing, uh, as you know, obviously uh, allegations of sexual harassment against a woman who, uh, by a woman who'd worked for him when he was heading up the EEOC. Um, so he merged from these hearings, uh, barely confirmed uh, 5248 to the Supreme Court, missed uh, the first uh, sitting in the Supreme Court uh, of arguments. He gets on that Supreme Court and the storyline very quickly emerged that Clarence Thomas was Antonin Scalia's lackey. That Clarence Thomas did not belong on that Supreme Court, that Clarence Thomas didn't have a brain in his head, that Clarence Thomas just did whatever Antonin Scalia told him to do. And if you go back and read some of the articles that were written at that time, I mean, people were I mean, respectable. People from very well-known legal institutions were saying things like, Thomas is just a lapdog for Scalia because he was voting, um, obviously. I mean, they had a conservative a judicial philosophy, obviously, if we see now, uh, not, doesn't necessarily always uh, uh, jive together. Uh, but that was the storyline that very quickly emerged, and that story um, is, uh, is grossly inaccurate. And in fact, if any justice that term was changing his votes to join the other, it was Justice Scalia who was changing his votes to join Justice Thomas, not the other way around. And it's all in the papers of, of Harry Blackman, which are in the Library of Congress. Say what you will about Harry Blackman as a justice, but he was a really good note taker. <laughs> <laughs> and so he would take these very detailed conference notes. And you know, during the conference, it's only the nine justices sitting around the table while they're talking about their cases. And so in those cases, Justice Blackmun would uh, take detailed notes on what each justice would say, and then he would record how they intended to vote. So you can look at Justice Blackmun's conference notes and then follow them through to see if any of the justices changed their position from what they had originally um, taken. And it happened repeatedly that term that Scalia would change his vote after conference to join an opinion, a dissenting opinion, uh, written by Justice Scalia. And it happened on Justice Thomas's very first conference in which he was casting a vote as a new justice. Think about that. I mean, he's sitting around this table with his new colleagues. He had just gone through these humiliating, I mean, deeply humiliating confirmation hearings. Um, he's the junior justice. 
and it was the third case that they were discussing that day. It was a case down in Louisiana involved a, uh, a man who had been found not guilty by uh, reason of insanity, and he wanted to get out of the mental institution, and Louisiana wanted to keep him there. The chief, uh, William Rehnquist, leads off this conversation, the discussion. He says a few words, and, and kind of surprisingly, he's going to cast his vote uh, for the state of Louisiana. And Rehnquist instituted this thing where each justice would get to speak before anyone uh, would jump in. So it goes around the table. This is all in Blackman's notes. Goes around the table, and each justice, in this case, uh, Fuchsia versus Louisiana, casts their vote with Rehnquist and against, uh, I mean, I said it just backwards, cast their vote with Fuchsia and against the state of Louisiana. So you've got all the justices, Rehnquist now, uh, leading off the conversation against the state of Louisiana, sorry, I said it backwards, and then all the other justices, the next seven, agreeing with him and also casting their vote for the inmate. And then it gets to Justice Thomas, and he paused, and he said, um, and again, this is in the notes, difficult case. Um, you know, Louisiana's arguments were strong, but he guessed he too would cast his vote for the inmate. He could not sleep that night. The next morning, he went to see William Rehnquist in his chambers. He said, I threw in the towel. That's not how I see that case. I was wrong. I'm going to change my vote. So Rehnquist said, OK, or you know that, OK, whatever, how are you <laughs> talking? Uh, you know, read your dissent, circulate it around. So uh, Justice Thomas uh, writes a dissent, uh, uh, siding with the state of Louisiana, circulates it around. A few days later, the chief sends a note around to the conference, all the other justices saying he was changing his vote. A few days after that, Scalia sends a note around. He's changing his vote. He's going to join Justice Thomas. Another couple days after that, Kennedy sends a note around. He's changing his vote. Of course, being Kennedy, he's going to write a separate dissent. But anyway, he changed his vote. <laughs> So that case, which started out, of course, 9-0 in the conference, the next morning 8-1, ended up being 5-4. Justice Thomas's um, dissent ended up persuading three justices to change their votes. And again, as I said, that happened repeatedly that term. But that, of course, wasn't the storyline. You know, we in the media saw Justice Thomas and Justice Scalia voting together so frequently on these cases, and the stories that were written was that Thomas was following Scalia. Instead, what was happening, and again, this goes to kind of the dynamics of um, the institution and why it's difficult and the calculations that presidents have to make so that even when the stars are in alignment, when you've got the right justice retiring that's of a different ideology, you've got the Senate of your same political party but you still have the court as a dynamic institution that you may or may not know exactly what's going to happen. And what happened the year that Justice Thomas joined that Supreme Court was that the court completely counterintuitively shifted and began to shift to the left because it was Justice O'Connor, you know, the former state legislator, the woman who was more the moderate, she saw herself kind of in this balancing role. That year, it was Justice O'Connor who started backing away, moving to the left. And you can see it in all of her memos. Again, these are all in the Blackman papers. She almost bristles. I mean, her language. I mean, that some of the things that Justice Thomas was writing. He was such a forceful conservative, particularly in issues that she cared deeply about, like habeas corpus, for example, that she never, that entire first year, she did not join a single one of his dissents. They'd be on the same side of the issue. I mean, she could obviously uh, was a moderate and cast votes with conservatives quite often. But she would always write these separate, sometimes just one paragraph, dissents of her own. She never joined one of Justice Thomas's. You know, so that year when liberals knew that Roe was going to get overturned, conservatives knew that Roe was going to get overturned. You had a, a frontal assault in the Casey case. That year, O'Connor joined with Souter and Kennedy to put Roe uh, really on more solid ground. I mean, Casey will make Roe uh, much more difficult now, I think, to overturn. You had a big school prayer case that year in Lee versus Weissman. Everyone knew that school prayer was going to be allowed. 
court said no. So when a president has that historic opportunity, often unexpected things can happen. Now, George Bush, um, as we all know, ended up getting an historic opportunity of his own because Justice O'Connor shocked all of us uh, by announcing her retirement uh, before that of William Rehnquist. So George Bush was in this position, the son, to make his own imprint on the Supreme Court by replacing that key swing vote in Sandra Day O'Connor. So he also would have a historic opportunity Um, The second part of my book really kind of goes behind the scenes and how, so it's really like two books for the price of one, (laughs) Um, goes behind the scenes and how President Bush ended up selecting, as you obviously uh, know, he first picked John Roberts to uh, replace Justice O'Connor, and then when the chief died in the summer, he moved Roberts over into that center seat and then turned to, um, if you can believe this, Harriet Myers. Uh, It's kind of hard to believe that that happened. Um, before finally settling uh, after Myers withdrew on Justice Alito. And I conclude that, I mean, Bush succeeded where no Republican president has, um, certainly not President Reagan, uh, and certainly not his father, in actually making a real change to that court. He and his people in the White House figured out, I believe, uh, how to nominate a judicial conservative. John Roberts and Sam Alito are not going to change. They're not going to... You know, as, as uh, Rehnquist always you know, said, well, some people say grow. Uh, you know, they're not, they're not going to, to evolve. They both have solid, uh, clear judicial philosophies. They were clear, and I think Chris's book is an incredibly important contribution to the debate, and I highly recommend it. I will disagree, obviously, with some of it, just like I know you do with mine. Um, I think that, for example, John Roberts' judicial philosophy was dead on display during his Uh, confirmation hearings. I mean, he articulated his views of judicial restraint, his views about the role of a judge, about the the proper role as he saw it of courts. Um, And and George Bush ended up getting two solid judicial conservatives on that Supreme Court. Uh, The last one, of course, being uh, Justice Alito, who in many ways, if we think about Justice Alito, uh, we've come full circle uh, uh, to the Clinton nominations of Justice Ginsburg with his, President Clinton's first nomination. Justice Alito and Justice Ginsburg have very similar uh, backgrounds. Um, Both worked for, you know, uh, uh, she working for obviously advancing liberal causes as an attorney, he uh, conservative. Uh, They both were very experienced, very highly regarded, widely respected on both sides of the aisle by both of their uh, liberal and conservative colleagues, uh, federal appeals court judges for many years. Uh, and so in many ways, uh, the Alito nomination is the mirror image, uh, just he's conservative and she's liberal of Justice Ginsburg. Uh, I will leave you with this, uh, there's one difference. Uh, Justice Ginsburg uh, was confirmed 90... 98 to, to three. three. Or so, I mean, so not, 96 to three, 96 something to like that. 96 to three, uh, and Justice Alito was confirmed, Doug, you know that, Fifth, almost... 58, I think. 58? Yeah. Uh, 58, 42. 42 against. Um, and I think that is, those vote discrepancies um, is the clearest manifestation of where we are now in the Supreme Court confirmation process. Thank you, Jim.